Hello, I'm Marco from Croatia. I work for Hazelcast uh, and I work on its distributed stream processing engine uh, that we call Hazelcast Jet. Uh, and today I would like to show you how you can use a distributed stream processing engine as an environment where you deploy your machine learning model uh, written in Python uh, to production and uh, the environment automatically takes care of several critical concerns like scaling, uh, fault tolerance and throughput optimization. Hello. So let me go to my first slide right away. Uh, I'll tell you just some basic facts about Hazelcast, my company, uh, <clears throat> which uh, will we'll come back to the importance of this. Uh, so we started uh, in 2008 uh, with a distributed caching product, uh, which, uh, which it, it's a category called in-memory data grid. Uh, which is a combination of distributed caching, that's the basic functionality, but also a lot of computation abilities. Uh, and then over the years, uh, we actually expanded on this uh, data local computation, computation in general. So today it's more like a product uh, that's almost like an in-memory database, but a bit relaxed because not all the data has to be all the time uh, in the memory, but in terms of uh, computation capabilities, it's similar. And then uh, later in 2017, we added another product built on this technology, which was uh, specifically focused on uh, stream processing, on live stream processing. So not, not just the data that's already there waiting in memory, uh, but uh, live events coming in, uh, just as the events occur in the reality, uh, we process them. So, so we'll be using this aspect uh, uh, in this talk. So, let me go on with the with the problem. So, what what this talk is about? Uh, I would like to start uh, by introducing to you a simple, uh, like almost uh, like a toy project in machine learning. Uh, which will then later on see uh, the challenges that, that you need <clears throat> to address before you start using this in production. So our example deals with salary prediction. It's, uh, it, it uses scikit-learn in Python, and specifically it's the random forest uh, machine learning model. So the, the job is like this. You have this input on the left-hand side, uh, some data about a, a person, and you have to figure out uh, what's, what's the likely income they have. Uh, so let me just briefly go over. Uh, I, I would like to introduce you to at least my vision of, of how actual data scientist uh, workflow is in this case. So uh, here I have actually some uh, uh, code written by a data scientist, but simplified to be more easily presentable. So uh, a data scientist basically has a, a, a bunch of data already uh, prepared uh, to do the training on. And uh, the, the output of the data scientist's work should be a model that, that is trained on this data and does the predictions. So let me just show you specifically, just as a brief overview of what exactly uh, we're up against here. So this is the totality of the code. It's not much, it's like two screenfuls maybe. Uh, it starts from uh, a bunch of tuples, uh, of bunch of feature vectors that we saw and does some typical operations uh, on it, which we can generally call massaging the data. Uh, you can see various steps that include uh, dropping some columns, adding some other columns, which enrich the original data set from some side inputs, uh, normalizing some fields, uh, which is necessary for the decision tree to work better, and so on. 
and so after we after we've prepared the tuples we go to the main point which is here random forest classifier we fit it to the model and that's basically it we dump it to the file so this first step is now done now comes the part where you actually start using uh, this uh, for predictions so the first approach which is not uh, ready for production but it's you can use it to to see if stuff works uh, you can use batch processing so this is another very similar piece of code because uh, as you most of you probably know when you when you do the prediction uh, you have to go through all the same steps uh, on the fresh data same massaging steps as you did earlier uh, on the on the, the training data set and then you just in the end instead of fitting the model you actually ask it to predict the result which is here so this is all fine and this will dump to the screen or to the file the result of prediction so how do we move on from this to something that can be actually accessed in a production system so online and we have one basic approach to this which is like this this is something that the data scientists could directly write themselves so we use flask a web server uh, we open some endpoint for posts and basically that goes to the same kind of code that we saw earlier to predict now this is an example of an input so this is one feature vector that you post to the service and then it produces the answer so that's that's the first step so at this point we have this picture uh, and from now on i'm not going to concentrate anymore on the details of the data science aspect but uh, on on this aspect of uh, using uh, this model so this is what we have now but uh, since this is uh, single threaded and normally many things in python are actually uh, single threaded uh, we want we want to go through all these steps to actually use uh, the machine uh, fully and uh, with the throughput that we actually need so basically uh, this is what happens so far we have this picture we did the data science we are ready to profit but actually in reality it's much more complicated and this is just a few of the steps that we will actually have to uh, go through uh, to make this production worthy so the rest of the talk is about these steps uh, so the first thing uh, you should do is parallelize this uh, in this picture i'm representing many parallel users but still everybody is connecting to the one rest service that we started so what you can do you can parallelize this uh, now we have many processes um, uh, many python processes and now each request is going to uh, one of them but this actually begs the question how does the client know which rest service to connect so we need a load balancer in front of it so we have a picture like this so we uh, we, we basically have one uh, single point of entry and then it decides which uh, worker to go to but uh, this is just the parallelization aspect uh, however in this particular case and i think it's uh, it's pretty uh, i think it generalizes well uh, i just didn't I, I don't have the data on it but i'm kind of pretty sure that this stands for many other models uh, the way the data scientist uh, works on the model on the data is always basically it's always batch oriented uh, the focus is on processing massive amounts of data at once in in a, the shortest possible time but uh, in the production setting we are dealing with disparate requests individual requests so actually it's not so obvious uh, how to batch things and on this chart uh, i did the measurement 
uh, the blue line in the bottom, which is basically just like a, a zero, but actually it represents something like five requests per second. This is what I got with the original single REST service that accepts a single feature vector and gives you the response. And then uh, I, I added batching, which means you can submit a single request to it, but uh, as a request contains a list of uh, feature vectors and you can see the dramatic increase in performance here and you can also see how it scales with uh, as i increase the number of parallel python processes so this shows both the effects of batching and parallelization and it's pretty obvious that you just need this absolutely need this uh, to be able to use your machine uh why why this happens i can i can tell you specifically uh, uh, uh for for the random forest uh so what is a random forest actually it's a bunch of decision trees where one decision tree uh, is just a bunch of if then else statements to to, to tell it roughly uh, and these uh if conditions that it uses are automatically generated, that's the process of uh, the machine learning. It has to figure out which questions to ask and how to branch into sub questions and so on, and, and finally uh, derive the result. So it turns out a uh, random forest could be thousands of such decision trees. Uh, it's just a, a we use random forest uh, instead of just decision trees because there are some known issues or quirks uh, with the uh, uh, decision trees uh, which which could be uh, something like overfitting or, or other uh, other issues due to which it, it doesn't it doesn't generalize well uh, to data it, is, it hasn't seen before but it turns out if you uh, use your original data set and split it into sub parts and then you uh, train many decision trees uh, on it uh, and then use this collection of decision trees to improve like to statistically analyze their results and pick uh, the most uh, the most popular answer so to say uh, you will get uh, much better results but this this costs uh, uh this this has costs uh, specifically here in terms of uh, memory storage if you expand one tree you have this pickled uh, format on disk uh, but when you uh, expand it into something executable it's quite a big size and uh if you would expand all those decision trees it will just take a lot of ram so what apparently sk learn does here it uh, takes deserializes uh, one by one these trees and then as it prepares one tree it runs all the data through it discards uh, deserialize the next one and so on and so obviously this has huge fixed costs uh just deserializing all those decision trees but uh, if you pay this fixed cost and then you run a lot of items through it it will amortize but if you run just one item, uh, the performance is terrible. So this is why I'm getting a mere four and a half, five requests per second. So th that's that's like the turnaround to 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 get through the random forest with any request of any size. It will take take at least two hundred milliseconds. So this is why batching was absolutely essential here, and this is also of course a challenge for production. So, to move on with, with our architecture, it seems that uh, except for just the load balancer, which would address uh, parallel parallelization aspect of the story, uh, we need uh, queuing. We need a queue. So we need one place where all the parallel requests come in, and then you have the opportunity to batch those together and send them as a batch to the load balancer and then as it as it processes one rest service processes the entire batch 
it goes back to the load balancer as a single response, goes back to the response queue, and now response queue can uh, can actually uh, can again divide this into uh, uh, specific responses to every every client individually. Uh, so so uh, on the client side, you still have blocking uh, behavior, uh, uh, simple request response behavior, but internally actually you're completely reshaping uh, this uh, traffic into batches that are processed in parallel. So that's the way to go. But this is a quite complex architecture uh, and it's a lot of moving parts. So this is uh, where, where uh, our uh, product comes in because uh, when you uh, employ a, a distributed stream processor, in, in our case, Hezekas Jet, uh, it actually takes care of all those issues of uh, batching, parallelizing, uh, scaling up uh, to use uh, many processes on a single machine, and also scaling out to a whole cluster, uh, distributing the data along the cluster. So that's the load balancing aspect. You get all this handled internally because that's how distributed stream processing works in general. I, I will say a bit later a few more things because uh, distributed stream processing is a, a wider category uh, that's not, it's not even, uh, it's not even uh, like the first use case isn't this, but it has a lot of machinery that comes in very, very handy uh, for, for this kind of uh, machine learning uh, deployment. And you can also see we uh, have Kafka here it's not necessarily Kafka, but Kafka is a very good choice in this kind of setup uh, because it's uh, it works like a queue. It's not actually a queue. It's called uh, a distributed log. And the advantage of a log versus a queue is that the data is always there all the time. So you don't just consume data, then it's gone. It, it stays there and it's deleted uh, lazily after a week or something. And this is very good uh, for resilience. Uh, if if the cluster loses a node, there will be a, a brief pause in the cluster while it's uh, reinitializing. And uh, also, you don't uh, at the point of failure, it's not clear where you dropped off. So with Kafka uh, in in the picture. You can easily just go to the last safe point where you are sure you processed everything to some offset of the message in the Kafka. And then, then you can move on from there. This guarantees you will process everything eventually. So let's briefly see uh, uh, what kind of code. This is Java, but we, uh, we are uh, working on uh, supporting other languages. I'm just... Uh, it, we are like still, the implementation is in Java. So for me, it's easier to show it uh, in Java. Uh, and this is actually almost all the code you need. Uh, so what's the idea here? How, how did we envision uh, this would work? You could uh, uh, write something like this code uh, on the same computer. Uh, on A data scientist could actually have this code uh, done. Uh, and uh, on your laptop, on your data scientist's laptop, you just have this directory where that I actually showed you. I, I was showing you the contents of that directory. So you just point it to this directory uh, and you name uh, the module that contains the business logic. And that's it. Uh, you, 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 you use a client uh, application <clears throat> that will connect to the cluster and it will automatically zip the directory that you have prepared, send it to the cluster, and then inside the cluster, it will be distributed to all the nodes unzipped. Then the whole initialization procedure will happen. Uh, uh, we'll, use, we'll create a Python virtual environment, install all the requirements uh, you need actually maybe can show you here. So this is the requirements text, completely uh, st standard uh, Python format. 
like this. So basically, uh, when, when I run this, uh, it will take all these files and just send them to the cluster for execution. And specifically, uh, the name of the module was inference bet. So let's just see what's the interface here, the API. It's very simple. You can see this is all the code. There is no other page of code. So no flask, no nothing actually. There is absolutely no trace of Hazelcast jet here. All you need to provide is this function, uh, which is by convention called transform list. You can actually configure another name. You just need a function that takes a list and returns a list. That's it, that's the contract. Take a list, process it, return a list, which matches one for one uh with the input items and these are your results so th this is all uh, the obviously this is pretty easy and the data scientist can write it directly so basically now you enable the data scientist to send something uh, to full production at full scale from the laptop that, that's something that's possible here and internally i i told you uh, that it would expand uh, that uh, python code and but it will also build this whole execution plan uh, these uh, nodes these boxes uh, represent uh, tasks so this is inside one jet node so we have some tasks uh, working and being connected uh, with data data queues so first you have a source task which connects to kafka it uh, parallelizes and sends in this example to two python processes and then here the batch is being automatically formed and this is not like a naive batching where you just say okay i'm waiting for a thousand items or i'm waiting for a second and see what i get this is actually so-called smart batching or natural batching uh, where you as soon as you get one item you send it to the python for processing but as Python is processing it, you get new data. And when Python returns, you have, let's say, 10, 20 more items to send. So now you just send those 20 items. You form the batch naturally just by waiting for the previous response. And this is how it works. The more data is coming in, the bigger the batch is. But on the other hand, when data is low or it's coming one by one, uh, it still doesn't mean you will lose any uh, you will lose any milliseconds uh, uh, adds to the latency of the process because everything will be happening at full speed all the time if it's just one item send it at immediately for processing this one item so that's how it works uh, so let let me show this to you online uh, here I will just use the jet start command this will start a jet node on my laptop basically i just took uh, i went to the web i downloaded the jet package uh, there was one thing i wanted i had to do extra which is like move the python extension module to the uh, lib folder basically I, I didn't have to configure anything so it's running here uh, and now let me submit the job so i'll say jet submit i already uh, used maven to compile it it's the code that you saw earlier so if i submit it uh the you can see this is this is the graph described in text uh, that that we saw you can see python commands running here uh, virtual environment being created uh we use pip to install the uh, requirements and now we can see python process is listening basically it's already processing the data and we are getting there we go 16 15 16 thousand requests per second from a single python instance and this is the s scikit learn code that would normally process just uh five requests per second if we didn't do the batching step so this is not the whole story now we have just one node but 
Jet also supports uh, uh, elasticity, which means I can just start another node. And now, although this all happens on my machine, it's actually they don't know about each other. They will talk to my router, which is somewhere here uh, on the wall. Uh, it will go over the Wi-Fi router. It will use the multicast protocol. This is something that we uh, have implemented and enabled by default. And you can see it discovered the other node through multicast. And now it will detect. You see, it's already reinitializing the job. It detected the cluster change. Now the cluster is bigger. So it will now proceed to run it. Uh, I'm now showing you the second node that I started. And you can see it's already initializing here. So this just happened automatically. I didn't do anything but start another node. Uh, now, when the init is done, we should go back to the to my window here, the tab where I submitted the job. You can see there was a pause it, because it was restarting. And now, if you remember, we saw 15, 16, but now we are getting 19, 20. It would be more if I wasn't also streaming. It, it it's, uh, fights for the same CPU resources as my online streaming normally it goes to 30,000 requests per second in this case also we can kill this node so now the cluster suddenly lost a node it already immediately detected this and it's already reinitializing the job to run on a single node so now there's a pause here and after a few seconds uh, which is mostly due to Python uh, initializing, we run. We are back in business and running. So these are these are the basic steps. This is the basic uh, value proposition of this approach. Uh, so as I was saying in the beginning, uh, uh, what you saw in action is just one aspect of this full stream processing system, uh, and uh, like the the core part. Uh, the major uh, thing that it does very well is uh, uh, you uh, is processing uh, very big streams like a single uh, single uh, instance on AWS. Like us, we are we were testing C five dot four x large. That's like a medium sized instance, and you can easily go to several million events per second processing. And what it does. Uh, with them, it it can do sliding window aggregation, uh, which is a very interesting thing. You can uh, summarize, basically summarize a big stream into a much smaller stream. Uh, for example, it could produce uh, some uh, uh, time derivative of any value you have. So you, if it's like a stock market example, then you could uh, uh, aggregate using linear regression and get trends uh, for the prices of all the stocks at, at once. So you may have many thousands of stocks and uh, ten, like 10 times per second, or it's already impossible to go to 100 times per second. Every 100, time, uh, 100 times per second, you get a new update with a very precise uh, 10 second sliding window uh, telling you the, the current trends. So, to, so this is good for immediate reactions uh, to the going zone. And so we have this other uh, operator. Uh, you can join streams, uh, you can enrich data, which is also very important uh, for uh, machine learning tasks. And finally, you, you, you can contact any arbitrary external service. And this is actually uh, the feature of JET that we use to run this code that we showed. It's a map, map using Python, basically. Python is the external service that we, uh, that we run. Uh, and I also wanted to show you uh, what you can, uh, so there is one, there is, there are many stream processing systems out there, but there is one thing about JET that's specifically making it uh, perform very well and especially have very low latency. And this is uh, its use of cooperative multi-threading. 
uh, which is maybe maybe you know from other languages go has it it's coroutines basically but languages like go or kotlin have native support for coroutines uh, so you can just write sequential code and in internally it's converted to uh, coroutines that can be uh, suspended and resumed at the programming language level so basically programming language uh, becomes the operating system in terms of scheduling uh, the operations and so what you get is like this something like this Let, let's say these are four cpu cores we have four threads and on a single cpu core you can see that uh, all these steps are running concurrently and basically you you give a little time to this task then it uh, voluntarily returns this is the cooperative aspect so we cannot force it there is no preemption here but you let it run for a while it returns uh, then you run another and so on round robin so this way you get concurrency on a single thread and it's controlled by jet code uh, and uh, i also mentioned uh, before uh, these uh, resilience features i didn't mention that you uh, i briefly mentioned fault tolerance but this is a, another uh, specific feature where uh, uh, you can uh, order jet to take uh, snapshots at the regular intervals which will remember all the state of all the computations that you have specifically in the kafka example it will remember the offset where it uh, where it uh, certain where it is certain that it processed the message in full up to the uh, sync. And then if when I kill a node, then you would use this snapshot to recover, to set, to reset back to that particular offset, and then you go on without data loss. And I also mentioned uh, that I was using cluster formation or automatic cluster formation which is by default using multicast, but of course in the cloud, multicast is no longer available. It has security issues. There's, you're, of course, you're sharing uh, the cloud with many other users. So actually uh, in those environments, you would use something specific uh, to the cluster using, a to the cloud environment using their native interfaces. And that's what we also support. So this, uh, you, you have to supply a bit of configuration like access and secret key, the obvious things that you need. And then you get this self-discovery in the cluster, in the cloud as well. And this is what we use all the time uh, for testing. And we have a number, a bunch of connectors, we, which means uh, where, you, where you pull the data from, where you put, push it to. We can uh, use Kafka, we can use... Uh, uh legacy databases even uh, oracle or ibm databases uh, all those that support the change data capture approach and those others that we see here and so that's it that was my talk uh, now i can check if there's any questions uh, in in this slido applications application uh -huh. I see one question. Uh, what about, I think, I guess I covered. So the question says, what about cloud, uh, Google Cloud? Uh, do they do the scaling uh, and managing automatically? So I haven't had personal first-hand experience with our Google Cloud uh, offering, but as far as I know, it should be on the same level as all others. So you have uh, cloud discovery, as I described it. Uh, the cluster, uh, this, you just deploy uh, instances into your part of uh, the cloud, your subnet, and then uh, using Google Cloud APIs, uh, they will discover each other and automatically connect. So that's, that's the last question. There are no more questions. So I guess that's it. Thank you for listening.